Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Cornland, just north of Springfield, which is the headquarters of Team USA, which is going to the Battle of Nations in May of this year. Now, you may not have heard the Battle of Nations, but more than uh, dozens of countries from around Europe and now the United States are going to Poland to compete in Western martial arts. So we thought we'd get some of these folks together. Three of them are from central Illinois to talk to us about the trip, about their sport, and about how all this works. Brad Shivey, I'll tell you what, it's a brutal deal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's real. It's real violence. Um, it's not a simulation. It's not scripted. And it's not a game. It, uh, it is a sport. It's an extreme sport. Mm -hmm. And it's MMA with steel weapons and armor. Mm -hmm. When you say MMA, what is that? Well, it's, it's mixed martial arts. You okay. know, people go around and see people do MMA, and they say, wow, the violence in MMA. Mm -hmm. You know, just imagine if you took a couple guys, put them in a steel cage, and gave them a steel axe. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Wow. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's um, it's not scripted. It is all live, and it is to submission. So you know, imagine someone my size swinging a seven-pound axe that's two-handed, and hitting you as hard as I can mm -hmm. to try and get you down to the ground and move on to the next guy. Okay. Once the person's down on the ground, subject's down on the ground, then he's out of the fight, right? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Good. Absolutely. So so it's not like he's going to get pummeled to death once he's <laughs> on the ground. He, yeah. He's, although yeah. it would be possible to pummel somebody to death because you guys are really seriously flinging some really heavy stuff. So accidents could happen or nobody intends to be right, maimed right. or injured, but your, it could happen. Your, your accidents usually come from an armor failure. So, you know, what will happen is a uh, piece of armor will move or, or not mm -hmm. being where it should be. And then someone comes in and hits you. Yeah. Is, mm -hmm. it, is there injuries? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, because, as you know, anything that's not scripted, it, oh, man. It's, it's Murphy's Law, right? Yeah. So what and you're happen? trying to yeah. win, right? I mean, oh, yeah. That's... Now, now, you've got a couple of colleagues here behind I us. Do. You know, Now, they're not necessarily trying to win. They're fighting for practice today and mm -hmm. to show us how this, how this sport works. Mm -hmm. But when you guys get to Poland for the World Games or the Battle of Nations, you you can't win unless you knock people out, right? Well, I mean, you absolutely. Have to. You've got you've got 12 nations there. You've got people coming from as far as Israel, the United States, Quebec, and this is a culmination of their entire life dream. Mm -hmm. You know, people like uh, myself and and Rob Roach and Rudy Knight, we've been reading about this stuff since we were children. The Battle of Agincourt, mm -hmm. you know, King Henry V and the Battle of Crecy. This is what we grew up on except now we get to live it. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you are representing the United States or, 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 or the people that we're gonna be fighting against or representing the countries that they're fighting for, uh, they're gonna give everything they have. Well, they sure and are. so you better, you better be prepared yeah. because there's not gonna be any let up, there's not gonna be any uh, slowdowns, and people are gonna do anything they can to win. And the fact is, in this sport, with this level of violence, you better be prepared. You okay. better have your head right. Well, let's see. Uh, introduce us to who we have here, and let's let's see a little of this action. Okay. What you have is you have on the right, you have Robert Roach from Peoria, Illinois. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have Rudy okay. Knight on the left, and he is from Cornland, right mm -hmm. here where we're sitting. Okay. And uh, what they're going to do is they're going to give us a demonstration today of a little bit about what you know what you see when people are fighting with uh, on the one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. So when we're in Poland. There are one-on-one -on -one competitions, there are five-on-five -five competitions, and 21-on-21. 20 and at the end of each day, they do the Grand Melee, which is 150-on-150. 150 150. So we're going to see some one-on-one -on -one is what we're Absolutely. Going to what you're going to see right now is one-on-one. -on -one. The two weapons that they have are falchions, and uh, they are single-handed falchions, and they hit uh, very, very stoutly, mm -hmm. which uh, I will show you now. Gentlemen, lay on. Now, Brad, how do you do that to a friend of yours? My goodness, because they really are hit. I mean, they're hitting oh, yeah, each they're other. Fighting. Right? They're fighting. So, you know, w what you see is you'll see a lot of shield punches. As you can see, Robert with the buckler and, mm -hmm. and Rudy taking the shots at the head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea is, is there's not one kill shot. The mm -hmm. idea is, is to get them down, get them mm -hmm. on the ground, incapacitate them. 
Hold. Brad, in one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes they'll fight with a shield and a sword. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll fight like this hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, right. beating each other with those up the... Right. And other times they'll have a long sword, mm -hmm. right? So what we're seeing here today is just one of like three ways that a one-on-one -on -one would take place. Absolutely. What you, see, what you see today is the buckler and the falchion. So it is just one of the three ways that you could do the single combats. Uh, the long sword is basically like a two-handed sword, what people recognize as a two-handed sword. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a sword and shield. So the buckler is a small steel shield that is very useful for punches to the body, punches to the face, mm -hmm. incapacitate the person you're fighting. The shield, which is your normal heater shield that you always see the pictures, the knights in armor yeah, of the shield, yeah. they do that also. Each one of those three conventions is a minute and a half. So wow. it's a real meat grinder. Well, let's see if we can get them going again. What okay. do you say to them to get them going? Okay. Gentlemen, lay on. Oh my goodness. It's nuts. Oh. <laughs> and you know, you take that shield, and if you text, punch somebody in the face with that shield, that has a real impact. Oh, absolutely. It? It, it, oh, it's very goodness. effective. Now, when they get to Poland, yes. the idea will be to, to knock one down, or do they count blows, or they how do they count blows? In the, in the single combats, they count blows. And hold. They count blows in the in the larger combats. Uh, it's to the ground. It's to submission. In the one on ones, they count blows. So each strike matters because there, mm -hmm. there's there's marshals there who are counting each one of them. So busy arms, you know, busy hands. Um, yeah. The blows to the body are more to incapacitate and slow down your opponent. Uh, with the uh, with the buckler and the swords are landing. As you hear that. Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. That's each one of those when you're inside of that armor. You can feel it. I'll be all that you can. <laughs> well, listen, we, we uh, also have more in this program because you have a specialty of your own, and you're going to get in your armor, and you're going to show us what you do. And mm -hmm. we also have, we, we met Rudy here. He was fighting. He's a blacksmith. Yes, he he's is. He's got a shop on his property, and he builds his own armor. Absolutely. So he's going to show us a little bit about that as Everything well. that he's wearing today, he built. Yeah. So, you know, some of us who don't have that skill, we have it shipped in from uh, places in the country, yeah. and the thing about it is there's very few places to buy this stuff from because it has to be fitted to you specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, why don't you get dressed for us, and okay. we'll visit with you, okay? All right, I'll Thanks. stand you. Okay. <laughs> okay, Rob Roach, let's backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. and describe to us what it takes to get into a full suit of armor. Now, you laid everything out here for us, and everything goes on in a specific order, Very right? much so. Because you layer everything, don't That's you? That's absolutely yeah. correct. What, do you, what is this that you've got on? So this is called a gambeson, and, uh, and most people don't understand that the, the arming clothes themselves are a function of protection. So these, this gambeson is made of uh, from 8 to 12 layers of linen, as well as what's on my legs. And it basically is medieval Kevlar. It, uh, I love it that, medieval force. Kevlar. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's got enough layers that it would blunt a, fo a, a forceful hit. Yeah, right? actually it quite does, yeah. Okay. And, and the, the, the whole idea is to dissipate force, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it works quite well. Um, th this arm, these armors are based upon continental Europe about 1355, mm -hmm. and the hard pieces start with sabatons, which are on my feet. Uh huh. And then those uh, are called sabatons. sabatons I call yep. them boots. Why mm -hmm. do you have the, the bow tied around? It actually there? laces to the to the uh, boot, which is underneath. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Many right. pieces actually use arming points, as you can see on the jackets and things. There are arming points, and they actually lace onto you. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and point? Oh, I see. Okay. Is this what we're looking at here? Yeah. Those okay. are those are arming. Those points. lace onto mm -hmm. you. Okay. So, so the first thing after the sabatons and your undergarments go to the legs. These are the greaves, which protect the these front are, and the back. These of are your... called greaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this one leg? Is this one leg? No, or is that these, both are, legs? these are both legs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. So this protects. Oh, it looks the like front. a shin guard on the back, yeah, kind of. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And that, and these are splints of steel mm -hmm. between leather, and they protect the back of your leg. Mm -hmm. Which, in our sport, uh, the back of the leg is a prime target. Okay. So it's very important. What's this up here? These are uh, uh, chouses. These are uh, basically steel uh, uh, protection for the knee, mm -hmm. and there are spring steel. Uh, plates underneath mm -hmm. that offer protection, again, dissipating force. And this is the way they would have been built in the medieval ages? Yes, okay. for this particular style of armor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you put the body armor on, which provides, that is called a, basically, it's called a coat of plates. And that's what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. And this actually ties to your body. No, actually, I'll show you what those are for, for to, uh, later. 
Okay. But this accordion's out, and these are bands of uh, hardened steel and plates, mm -hmm. and they protect you, and they actually accordion and move with you as you, as you fight. See. It's actually fairly light. A lot of people think that armor is heavy, but we use a very specific high carbon steel, and it's hardened, and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it has worked. It's not as heavy as it would have been back then. No, actually, they... it's about right. Their, <laughs> really? metallurgy, their metallurgy was a lot, was far more advanced than people really? understand. Really? I'll be darned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. They use high carbon steel, um, and that's where the art was to get that carbon, and mm -hmm. the blacksmith would figure out exactly how that happens. This we can identify. We know what that is right yep. off the bat. What about over here? So those are arm. That's the arm harness. So this protects my uh, my forearm and my elbow, mm -hmm. right? And this here is called a rear brace, which protects the back of your arm. Again, a very prime target. Okay, and that's what we're looking at right here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And those lace onto this uh, this garment. Okay. These here are, uh, are, ba are spalders. Can I pick one up? Absolutely. Okay. And those spalders protect the shoulder joint and uh, farther down into the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And those actually lace to this. Oh, okay. That's what you were going to show us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then that goes, that obviously goes around your neck. Yeah, that is called a gorget. Mm -hmm. uh, gorget. And there are as bands of, of steel underneath. Wow, everything's reinforced, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And what that does, that's, that is uh, secondary protection for your throat and your collarbone. Mm -hmm. The primary protection is that steel or the, the chain around the helmet, that's, which is called an aventail. Okay, that's the, what's hanging down. And that acts as a drape to protect my throat. Okay. But should a should a force come in strong enough, mm -hmm. then the gorget is to protect my throat. Gotcha. Okay. Because it's very easy to kill someone when you get hit them hit them with the throat. Yeah. And then you we've still got the gloves there. Yeah, I guess they're are, called gloves. These are gauntlets. Gauntlets. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. And these are uh, reinforced finger gauntlets. There's layers of wool underneath, in between the glove mm -hmm. and the steel. And on the bottom side, you'll see there's also steel plates. Mm -hmm. So this is spring steel. It's hardened spring steel. So, and that protects my, uh, my fingers from being smashed. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, actually, I, I use a sword a lot. This is, this just basically adds protection for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's your right, you, you wield with the right hand? With the right hand, Okay. Yeah. Um, the last piece of protective armor is actually this belt. Um, it's, a, it's a belt made of thick brass plates and it's decorative, but the actual function is that it protects the hip joints. So as it rides, as you have seen before, it rides on my hips, mm -hmm. so it protects those hip joints. Okay. So, but that's basically all of the elements of the uh, of armors, mm -hmm. and then of course we have the weapons. So, Rudy Knight, this group of fighters has something that not every group has: their own blacksmith, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and that's you, right? Yes. How did you learn to blacksmith? Um, necessity. Necessity. Um, Especially in the earlier times of fighting, uh, this before the internet was really available, um, there wasn't just we weren't able to just go online and buy a piece and have it shipped to us. Um, patterns were also hard to come by, and so it just made more sense when you have you and your three friends that want to get into armor just to learn how to make it. Mm -hmm. Mind you, it ended up being a lot easier said than done. Oh man, I'll bet it took you years and years to get to the point where you could make something like this. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, everything that I make is just one step better than the previous one. Mm -hmm. and that's all I can ask for. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is better than my last one, and I'm hoping that my next one is going to be better than this one. You haven't even had a chance to wear this yet. This is the first. This is the first. Yes. Uh, you finished it yesterday, right? Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'll be putting it on for the first time today, and I uh, hopefully okay. everything. Sits now, right. when you designed this, what were you looking for? What sort? Of, what were the issues that you needed to to uh, to get right? Okay, um, first of all, it had to be able to fit my head with mm -hmm. uh, at least a quarter inch of padding in there. Um, secondly, it had to um, be a, a particular style. The kits that we have to wear in Battle of Nations have to be specific to that time period. So for example, what I'm wearing is early 15th century Italian. Therefore, every piece that I'm wearing must also be from that time period mm -hmm. or have been used. So. I needed to make this. The Northern Italian style um, of a bassinet uh, was a, uh, what they call a pig face, which had the long, there's a variety mm -hmm. of different shapes, but in the end they were all that. Um, this allowed for a little bit more breathing than your more flat visor. 
and uh, as you can see, worked out really well for if someone was going to be thrusting you or lancing you, you'd get a, a graze. Right. Breathing was important, having enough holes. Mm -hmm. The angles of this were important. To be Italian, I had to have my hinges on the side, where a lot of them, you'll see that they're hinged on the top. Mm -hmm. The Italians did it this way. Mm -hmm. um, what the about other... your sight lines? Was that an issue? Yes. If you get this off, if it's too high or too low, you can't see hardly anything. Mm -hmm. But once it's on uh, right, and if it's angled right, all you see is a nice mesh in front of you, and you have more visibility than what you would think. Do, can I pick it up? Yes. Okay, I just want to show how you've attached the mesh. Is that called mesh to the um, bottom? Chain mail. Ch chain what? Chain mail. Chain mail, okay. And you that's also notice... part of it. That protects your neck. Huh? Yes, and you'll notice that this is, uh, these are flat and riveted. Wow, what a piece of work. Okay, now, the steel doesn't come cheap either that this is no. made out of. No. This is, what do you call this? Um, this is what we'd call 1050 is the number on it, spring steel. Oh, it's heavy. This is a uh, high carbon steel and it's ideal for what we do because it's very malleable in its form right here and when it's hot it's actually pretty pliable. Mm -hmm. But once you heat treat it, it um, is it's hard as a rock. Um, so it's perfect properties for what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's malleable enough that you can mold it to, to a helmet. Yes. Amazing. Yes. You could. Uh, it, uh, as long as you're careful and you're moving your metal slow, you won't have any issues yeah. with it. If you wanted to buy a helmet like that, if somebody made them to, to for sale, how much would you have to pay for it? Um, Eleven to fifteen hundred dollars for that helmet. Wow. Um, and a lot of that, that would include the chain mail and such that's mm -hmm. on there. Um, so yes, it's very pricey to buy. Now I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, you made the armor that you have on here. Yes. In this shop. Yeah. And I asked you if you could demonstrate something for yes. us. And so you have a piece of, of metal in, in, the, in the forge right now. Yes. And you're going to work on what? I'm going to be working on my greaves, which is my lower legs, are the last pieces that I need before I go to Poland in mm -hmm. 10 days. So uh, I have to have them fully encased because those are legal targets and they can hit me in the back okay. of the shins. All right. Well, let's see a little bit of the process. Let's go, go and dig one of those uh, pieces sure. out and see how we do it. very hot. Yeah, very hot, like what, a thousand degrees? Um, it's currently sitting at 1200 degrees. Jeez, 1200. When we heat treat, we try to bring it up to 1500, um, which gives it a nice cherry red. But it's not necessary when you're working it. This uh -huh. is uh, sitting at about probably, the metal itself is probably about 800 degrees, and it'll hold it for a little while. Mm -hmm. And what you do initially is you come in over here, and you can see this would be the back of the uh, calf. Um, and so I'm trying to get that initial bit of a uh, dish out um, to go around there. And you transfer it over into here where I can then get a deeper dish. Uniformity, because this has to match up to another one that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the curves have to be consistent all the way around it, which mm -hmm. is one of the big advantages of having a variety of these dishing plates. I can more guarantee um, the shape that I'm going to have. Now I've got it a little bit shaped. Now I need to give it the curve that's going to go right along mm -hmm. down my leg which I'll bring over to this plate. Oh. You'll start to uh, get it to misshape along the way, and you just have to work with that. Mm -hmm. Now I want to show something that this is what you're shooting for right here, right? Yeah. Something similar to this. This is the uh, next stage of it. Mm -hmm. So once I get this along like that, then I'm able to take it I'll weld it together, mm -hmm. and then I'll start cleaning this up, and then once that's done, then I'll be able to attach mm -hmm. this to the other piece. Mm -hmm. Wow, a lot of work, a lot of work. Yeah. Um, it starts to cool down relatively quick, so you have to get it back in the oven every couple minutes. Often I'll have two pieces 
I'll have one in there that's mm -hmm. heating while I'm working the other, and I'll rotate it out as long as my stamina can keep up with that. Yeah. Bending the, this stuff's pretty easy to work with because um, because of the high carbon content, we're able to get it really hard. We can use a thinner metal and therefore lighter. But when it comes to the helmets, we're using a whole lot thicker, and that takes a lot out of you. Every helmet you make takes just a little bit of your life. <laughs> <laughs> but it may save your life too. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, just we don't. Uh, we don't go cheap when it comes to protecting our heads. Brad, it's pretty intimidating <laughs> looking at you, man. It really is. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? <laughs> good, I guess so. When yeah. you get to Poland, you want to be intimidating. Yeah, absolutely. I want you to think twice before you come up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it took three people about 20 minutes to get you in this in this armor. Yeah, it did. And, and a guy in the field in the medieval ages would have had the same issue, right? He yeah, couldn't he, put all this on by no, himself. No, he would have had squires and pages to help armor. Yeah. Um, you got to fit, you know, somebody that would have been wearing a harness like this would have been part of the nobility. Um, <laughs> you know, it would have been a landed baron or, mm -hmm. you know, or, uh, you know, someone that their entire life revolved around wearing a harness mm -hmm. and, uh, and fighting. And so I would have had people you know, kind of like we do today, we have people that, that help us get armed up and, and help us get in harness, because mm -hmm. without that, it would be impossible. Vicki, would you come over and, and, and remove that face plate for him? Because so, I think he has to scratch his nose. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good deal. All right. Now, th you, have a, you have a specialty in this, and, mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're dressed as a person who has a specialty. You <laughs> would, might be on a horse. Or you might be on the, on the front, but you've got a very a very specific instrument I that do. you use. What's it called? This is a halberd. Um, this is a weapon that is used for destroying people in plate armor, like what I'm mm -hmm. wearing. Um, you know, if you take with what I have on, a sharp sword isn't going to do much. Mm -hmm. This is a large can opener. So you know, when we go to Poland. This is severe blunt trauma, and it's coming more than once. You know, I, I want to show, when you say severe blunt trauma, we, uh, you tested that, and you wanted to test to see what that would do on a standard helmet. Absolutely. Each one of these creases is a separate blow. It's That's correct. One blow. Yeah, one Can blow. Can you imagine if your head was in there? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, man. And what that is, is that's kind of a standard steel that they're using in Poland. Mm -hmm. That's about the equivalent. So what we wanted to see was just how stout of a blow I'll be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so some of us got around, tested it out, and then we were quite surprised by what took place. I'll be doggone. There will be 33 on Team USA. For that, for the Battle of Nations, that's a small team, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, we've got, you know, some of the Russian teams have a lot more than that. Um, each five on five, and we had to have three five-man teams, but on each one you had to have three alternates. So really it's eight and eight. So, you know, one of the competitions we have is 21 on 21. So you have to take enough people to be able to meet those requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia's probably got one of the largest, Poland's probably the second largest, uh, Belarus and the Ukraine. They have probably 50 fighters each. Wow. But, you know, for the United States, being the first time we've been invited to field 32 uh, men that do this and love this and can fight to this level, it's a, it's a huge accomplishment for the United States this year. How much does this thing weigh? This is actually 6.2 ounces. Uh, the rules say it can be 6.6 .6 ounces. So, pounds, uh, you mean? Or I mean, pounds. six point, yeah, six yeah. point, six point two uh, pounds, and it can be six point six pounds mm -hmm. so uh, I'm actually in the legal limit and um, you know it, the thing about this is is when you swing this you don't have to be right on and it still delivers what you want mm -hmm. well listen good luck to you uh, to you and your colleagues we got to meet three of them here from Illinois, from central Illinois and uh, it's become actually this has become Springfield has become the headquarters for Team USA. You'll be hearing more about this team as the year goes on. Good luck to them first of May when they go over to Poland for uh, for the Battle of Nations. And uh, since they're undertaking something that uh, that could be uh, violent of nature, not only good luck to them for winning, but good luck for good health as well. With another Illinois story in Cornland, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching.
Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.